Good to see each and every one of you, and welcome to those on Facebook. Hopefully we will be seeing more of each other soon as things continue to open up. Welcome to worship. Let's start right off this morning with a hymn, um, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Could you stand as we sing together? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Please be seated. Father, thank you that through Jesus you sought us when we were your strangers. You bought us with his blood and you have sealed us for redemption. We know that we are so prone to wander, prone to go our own direction. But we come to you now asking you to draw close to you, asking you to to deeply encourage us and, and teach us and, and, and fill us with your spirit this morning. <clears throat> Be glorified in this time of worship and we pray that we would um, not just sing and read and hear about you, but that we would encounter you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning call of worship this morning is from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing. Now please uh, rise and join us if you can for some worship songs. Grow with food 
celestial feet have never failing ruler of my heart everlasting lover of my soul on the mountain high or in the valley low the king of love my shepherd it is the king of love my shepherd is and foolish off I strayed, but yet in love he sought thee, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil I fear no ill, with thee dear Lord beside me. And staff, my comfort still. Thy cross before to guide me. Never failing, never failing. Ruler of my heart, everlasting. Lover of my soul, on the mountain high, or in the valley low. The king of my shepherd is. to know that God is the lover of your soul. He loves you more than we can imagine. <clears throat> Sing a song God. Oh, great God of highest heaven, Occupy my lonely home. Conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or that resist your holy war. You have love and purchase. No, your love within had 
So go with God's blessing on you and the teachers. Teachers, thank you for all that you do. Pouring into our kids. And as they leave, I want to share a few announcements with everyone uh, here and at home. Hopefully, hopefully, Lord willing, this is the last Sunday maybe ever, that we'll have two services. Um, I say that because next week the plan is, Lord willing, weather permitting, to be outside uh, all together at 15 behind the gym center. So please pray for that, that end. Um, if it's too cold or if it's rainy, we will be inside and have a 9 o'clock and a 1015. But you never know. It could be 70 and uh, bright and sunny. So we'll, we'll let you know the final call on that next Saturday night through an email and a Facebook post. Um, now, uh, what else do I need to tell you? The annual meeting is scheduled for May 23rd, so that's in three weeks from today, right after church. That will either be outside or in this uh, in the church building. Um, also, um, Trudy, you may have seen the email a couple weeks ago. Trudy, after about a year and a half of serving as the administrative assistant, is stepping down. And we are so grateful for what she's done to help keep the church running. She and Reggie are going to be off on some adventures together when he retires soon. Um, and there's an opening for that position. So, um, we emailed out the, the job description with that announcement last week or two weeks ago. So feel um, or if you if it's something you want to consider, uh, talk more to the trustees or to me about that. She's leaving June first, so we have about a month to fill her position. Any other announcements? Um, am I forgetting anything? I'll ask you. Yes, Rebecca. Thanks for clarifying. Yes, Sunday school will continue through June. Um, well, the June 13th is Children's Day, so it will continue through the Sunday. But the first Sunday in June is the last day of Sunday school. And after that, we may change the service time to 930. But... That's not official yet, so 
Yeah, Meg. Great. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mike. So for this Facebook, VBS is August first, first through fifth, and it's time to be determined. Um, Hope there's a lot of kids. Let's let's be praying for that, uh, even now. Okay, well let's let's pray. Let's spend some time um, together in God's presence, um, confessing, asking, um, being with Him, um, just praying to Him. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your lavish love. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for um, bringing us to the awareness of uh, what Jesus has done and for helping us to come to him and see him and respond to him in faith. We know that's not something we would have done by ourselves or um, given if, if we were left to our own devices but you have opened our eyes. So thank you, God. We thank you for this day that you've made and for the chance we have to be together and to worship you. And we thank you for those that are sitting at home and um, joining in that way. We thank you that more people are returning to church, getting getting vaccinated and coming back. Thank you for the promise of full reintegration and um, we just look forward to what you will do this summer and this fall and as we, as we follow you as a church. We thank you for new people who have become part of our fellowship and uh, for new friendships that have been formed, for the small groups that have started, um, just for everything that you have been doing even as the pandemic has happened. God, you have not been contained by that. Lord, we come to you this morning. Um, Just first, I want to take a moment for us to acknowledge um, our sin, to be, to hold that in your presence, to be honest with you about uh, what's inside us, and to receive your, uh, just the reminder of your cleansing power in Christ. Help us, God, to be um, ever more in love with you than we are with our sin or ourselves. Give us hearts that turn quickly and easily. Give us um, the desire to, to serve you and to glorify you as we just sang, you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. So Lord, set us free to do that more and more. We lift up to you, Lord, uh, many people whom we love who are in, in need of your help. Um, we think of Valerie now who's facing um, uh, uh, not having the help she needs for her daily life at home, not having the nursing care she needs. We pray that you would provide someone, you would provide a way for her uh, to be taken care of. And for Alexis, as she um, goes through that uh, uncertainty and anxiety as well, would you give them both your peace? We um, pray for Helen Butler. Uh, recovering from her fall, that you would fully restore her um, her body where it's been bruised and hurt. Thank you that she did not break 
her hip, but we pray for a full recovery for her. We pray for those in our congregation and in our families who are battling um, just long-term illness, cancer, or, or some other diagnosis, and we pray for them. We pray for their body and their uh, mind and their spirit to be held in your perfect peace and for your healing power to be in them. We pray, Lord, for um, the hidden burdens that we bring today, things that are um, things that happen in our homes that cause us stress and, and trouble, um, things that happen at work that are hard and stressful, things that uh, we deal with just in our own hearts, in our own minds. Thank you that you are, you are greater than the world and that you are, can be a shelter for us and a, a um, thank you that you treat us compassionately and gently in our struggles. So we take a moment now to just in our hearts to name those things to you, and to ask you for your help. I also want to give some time just for anyone to lift up the name of someone um, who needs prayer. Lord, you are um, so good to us, and we thank you for all the ways that you are at work in our lives. Thank you for um, the spring and the, the good weather. Thank you for children. Thank you for families. Thank you for um, food to eat and a pillow to rest our head on at night. Thank you for the health, the breath in our bodies, the life that you've put in us. Thank you for our teachers and the job they're doing. Thank you for leaders in um, uh, local and state government. Thank you for leaders in federal government and other nations. Uh, thank you for everyone who um, has been working through the pandemic to care for others and to uh, working to find a cure, a vaccine, working to make decisions. We thank you that you have been at work through all those things. We thank you, God, also for um, David Anderson's good news that he does not have mouth cancer and for giving him um, uh, just such, such a blessing in that, him and his girls, Melissa and Michelle. And we thank you for every way that you have come through for us and provided for us and every way you will in the future. So God, with, with full hearts and confidence in you, we um, pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. 
If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Thank you, Kara. I know we just prayed, but let's pray again. I know that I need it. As we come to this really difficult doctrine about hell this morning, Lord, um, just be with us, guide us, help me to speak truthfully from your word. Give us all um, ears to hear and hearts to receive um, even even a difficult teaching like this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I need to start by saying, I do not want to believe in hell. Who does? Right? In 2011, a book came out by an evangelical pastor named Rob Bell. The book was called Love Wins. A book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who has ever lived. Pretty ambitious topic. Um, one of the main points of his book was, maybe we've gotten hell wrong all these years. Maybe there is no place of eternal judgment. Maybe, in the end, God's love is bigger than all of that. Boy, that's a nice thought. I would love to believe that. Many people um, praised him for, for writing these things. He was interviewed on the Oprah Winfrey Show, and um, he was praised for preaching a gentler, more inclusive faith. I would love to believe what he said is true. Um, but his book caused a real stir in the Christian world because it challenged and questioned, even, even undermined the traditional doctrine of hell which for thousands of years Christians have um, largely believed, and our statement of faith puts it this way. We believe in the bodily resurrection of both the just and the unjust, the unjust to judgment and eternal conscious punishment in hell, and the just to dwell eternally in heaven. Eternal conscious punishment for obvious reasons, people have had issues with that. Rob Bell was not the first person to come along and call that into question. For thousands of years, Christians even have been saying, isn't there another way to understand this? Isn't there a loophole? Maybe hell is not quite like the Bible says it is. And Rob Bell is one of the latest questioners. He, here's a quote from his book, Love Wins. Has God created millions of people over tens of thousands of years who are going to spend eternity in anguish? Can God do this or even allow this and still claim to be a loving God? Does God punish people for thousands of years with infinite eternal torment for things they did in their few finite years of life? These are not trivial questions. These are questions we should grapple with when we think about hell. And the longer you think about them, the tougher they get. These are the kinds of questions that just can stick in your craw and even make people turn their back on, on the Bible. Um, a friend of mine I was speaking with a few months ago who knew that I'm preaching this doctrine series, she told me, honestly, I, I just can't believe in that. I can't believe in hell. I can't believe in the whole eternal conscious punishment thing. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. 
You may be feeling that way. Or you may have never thought about it very much and um, realize now that uh, that it's a big deal. Well, as difficult as the doctrine of hell is, I, I do believe it. And the number one reason is because Jesus believed in hell. Jesus taught about hell more than anyone in all of the Bible. And so I want to do three things in this sermon today. I want to first look at what Jesus said about hell. Second, what he did about hell. And third, what we can do about it. What we can do in response. So what Jesus said, what Jesus did, and what we can do. Now, I have to promise you that this will be an uncomfortable sermon. It, w- it was hard for me to write. And I hope it causes you to question some assumptions you've had, perhaps. I hope it raises questions that you will wrestle through on your own. But ultimately, I hope that it will fuel our growth in Christ and our zeal for the Lord and even our love for the lost. So what Jesus said about hell, number one. Well, he spoke about hell or eternal judgment more broadly in many places. Um, But we're using this passage in Mark chapter 9 as a representative text, as an entryway, partly because the word hell is in here three times in just a few verses. When you hear that word, hell, I wonder what comes to mind for you. The stereotypical image of hell is like this underground torture chamber where the devil and his minions run around cackling and poking people with pitchforks, right? Which is not what Jesus was talking about. The word he used here, (coughs) translated hell in our Bibles, is a Greek word, Gehenna. Gehenna was the name of a place of a valley outside of Jerusalem on the southern tip of Jerusalem. <coughs> Gehenna is the, he, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Gehinnom. It was the val- called the Valley of Gehinnom. And that place had a sordid and notorious history. Um, at the time of Jeremiah the prophet, things were so spiritually dark in Israel that many Israelites were worshiping the pagan gods Moloch and Baal. (coughs) And part of the worship of these pagan deities was done in the valley of Gehinnom. They built altars to these gods, and on these altars they would sacrifice their own children by burning them alive. This was the kind of reputation attached with that valley. Now, when King Josiah came to power in the 7th century, he, re- he reformed Israel, including desecrating all of the altars of Baal and Moloch, putting human bones on them, and furthermore, making sure that that valley could never be used for any kind of worship again. He turned it into a place um, of unclean things, a garbage dump, essentially, where you would take your dead animal carcasses and your, your toilet emptyings and your trash, and you would burn it there in that valley, the Valley of Gehinnom. Scholars believe that even at the time of Jesus, it was being used for that purpose. And even to this day, the Valley of Gehinnom is essentially a dump a large dump. A writer named Edwin Black actually went there Uh, in 1999. He wrote an article about this in the Washington Post. He went there to write about this place. He had trouble getting there because no Jewish taxi driver would bring him near because it's such a desecrated place in their culture. But he eventually got there, and here's what he wrote. Below the old city walls in Jerusalem, There's a ravine that begins as a gentle, grassy separation between hills 
then quickly descends south into the rocky earth. Eventually, the ravine becomes a steep, craggy depth, scarred on its far side by shallow caves and pits pocked by hollowed-out chambers and narrow crypts. Everywhere you see scorches and smolder from trash fires. Rivulets of urine trickle down from open sewers at the cliffs above, watering thorn bushes, weeds, and unexpected clumps of grass among the outcroppings. You smell the stench of decaying offal, the congealed stink of putrefied garbage, and the absorbed reek of incinerated substances seared into the rock face. Crows circle low, worms and maggots slither throughout. Are you getting the picture of what Jesus was referring to? The, word, the name for that place was the word he chose to describe the place of eternal judgment. Not that in that literal valley people will be thrown when Jesus comes back, but the symbols are probably even more chilling, right? That's the word he chose to talk about the final destination of the damned. As I was reading many parts of the Bible this week, about hell, I found three, three things about hell that we need to understand. And, and when I looked at this passage, I realized they're all right here in this passage as well. First, hell, or this Gehenna, is the place of final exclusion. It's on the outside of God's kingdom. You get a sense of that by reading Verses 43 and 44, where Jesus says, It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell. Or, verse 44, It is better for you to enter life crippled than have two feet and be thrown into hell. Verse 47, It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Don't get hung up yet on these gory images of cutting off your hand. We'll get to that later. But do you see the contrast between entering life and entering the kingdom and being thrown into hell? Being received into the kingdom versus being cast away on the outside, excluded from all that is good. Jesus says it even more starkly in Matthew chapter 8 and other places where he says those on that day who are, who are judged will be cast into a place of outer darkness. Outer darkness. You see, hell is a place of exclusion. It's not that at the end of life there are these two doors and one's door number one that goes down to hell and one's door number two that goes up to heaven. Like these two equal and opposite locations. Jesus is coming back and bringing his kingdom and making all things new, and bringing, you know, the full, uh, his full purposes to this earth, and he's going to fully uh, uh, purge everything that is sinful and evil from the world. Where does that go? Hell, the place of exclusion. Hell is to the kingdom of God what. Gehenna, the garbage dump, was to the city of Jerusalem. A place of exclusion. Second, hell is a place of destruction. That becomes pretty clear in verse 48, where he says, The worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is lifting, quoting a verse from the prophet Isaiah, the, the last verse of the book of Isaiah, which pictures the final destruction of God's enemies, of the people who rebelled against God. Here's what that verse says in context. God is saying, the people in his kingdom, quote, will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them do not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. These are gory images, jarring images of destruction. 
Have you ever seen a house on fire? I know at least Mike Lachance has. The destructive power of fire. Have you ever come across a, the carcass of an animal and found worms doing what they do? Images of destruction, of disintegration, of, of, uh, of decomposition. And that's what Jesus describes hell is. Except in this place, the fire burns but never burns up, and the worm eats but never consumes. It's like perpetual, even eternal disintegration and destruction. I wonder if it's the kind of place where everything about a human being will be lost and destroyed, even the very image of God somehow, until nothing is left but horror. Well, fire is also a symbol of something else. This is the third thing about hell. It's a place of punishment. It's not just that people end up there as, as a necessary you know, being excluded, but it's a place where sin is finally and fully punished. Fire is often an image of God's wrath against sin. Now, we have a hard time thinking of God's wrath and God's punishment because it doesn't line up with our view of a loving God, of a compassionate God. But his wrath is a dimension of his holiness. When sin, when something that, that rupture, ruptures the moral fabric of his world, uh, when he comes against that, his wrath burns against that sin. That's simply part of who he is. It's not cruel. It's not that God is enjoying punishing people, but it's simply what his justice requires. He says, uh, God says in Ezekiel 18, verse 23, Do I take pleasure in any death of the wicked? So do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But Jesus knows, just as God the Father knows, that people, not everyone will turn. Uh, some will go to the place of punishment for their sin. So according to Jesus, hell is a place of exclusion, of destruction, and of punishment. And the rest of the Bible only confirms and strengthens these ideas. I don't want to believe that. I don't like that idea. Um, this is personal for all of us. We have family members, friends we dearly love who we know have not trusted in Jesus, have not repented of their sin. We have people we love who have gone, who've, who've died. We, we, we have no reason to believe that they ever did trust in Jesus. And I don't want to believe that they're in a place of eternal separation from God and punishment for sin. But I didn't write the Bible. I just have to go on what Jesus and what the rest of Scripture says, and I have to trust in God's ultimate justice and ultimate goodness. I think, friends, we have all experienced um, foretastes of what hell might be like. If you've ever been through a deep depression so that life didn't seem worth living, and just felt that deep loneliness and, and, and anguish and exclusion. If you've ever lost a child, if you've ever seen war, if you've ever suffered serious trauma, if you've ever been in the grip of an addiction that destroys your life, you kind of have a foretaste of, of what that place will be like. But there's a big difference. In this life, there's always the hope there's always the presence of God with us, comforting us. There's always the promise that God will take the bad stuff and the pain and redeem it and weave it into his good plans for our lives. And that, I think, is the worst thing about 
hell. There's no hope. There's no promise of redemption anymore. There's no, um, there's no presence of God to comfort. Only the, the horrifying awareness of God's wrath against sin. That's hard to believe. But I think if we read our Bibles and if we um, think about what we experience in life, it's true. Well, we have to read what Jesus said about this, what he said about hell with what he did about hell. They're two sides of the same coin. What did Jesus do about hell? Like every other Christian doctrine, friends, we have to understand its relationship to the cross, the cross of Christ. It all comes back to the cross. The reason Jesus went to the cross was to endure hell for us. Think about it. He suffered and died for one, to endure God's punishing wrath against sin. He, the wrath was poured out on him. He experienced it to the full. He also faced destruction. His body was destroyed. His, his mind and spirit were in anguish. He was tortured. His, his reputation was shredded. Isaiah said that he was marred beyond human likeness. He faced destruction and disintegration. And he was excluded on the cross. The very place of the crucifixion where they nailed him up to that beam was a desecrated place where executions happened frequently. There was probably even a mass grave nearby where the soldiers would dump any unclaimed bodies. That's the kind of place that Jesus went to for us and died. And furthermore, he was excluded from the presence of God himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried. He knows exactly what that outer darkness is like because guess what? He was the first one who ever went there. That's what Jesus did about hell. That's what he did for us on the cross. Let me illustrate this by reading a short anecdote I heard. <clears throat> the story goes... A duck hunter was with a friend in the wide open land of southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed a cloud of smoke. Soon he could hear crackling as the wind shifted. He realized the terrible truth. A brush fire was advancing so fast they couldn't outrun it. Rifling through his pockets, he soon found what he was looking for, a book of matches. He lit a small fire around the two of them, and soon they were standing in a circle of blackened earth, waiting for the fire to come. They didn't have to wait long. They covered their mouths with handkerchiefs and braced themselves. The fire came near and swept over them, but they were completely unhurt, untouched. Fire would not pass where the fire had already passed. That's the cross. The place where the fires of hell have already passed is on Jesus at the cross. That is, our, that is our hope. That is why we can have confidence that hell is not our future for those who trust in Jesus and have repented of their sin and clung to the cross. That's what, what takes away the power of hell the promise of hell in our lives. So knowing what Jesus said about hell and what he did about hell, what can we do? Where does that leave us? Some live as if Jesus' death on the cross cancels what he said about hell. That because he died, forgiveness is available and we have carte blanche to just do whatever we want. Right? But I think we need to take Jesus' words seriously. We need to not divorce them from the cross, but put them together. So first, 
I, I want to leave you with two things. First, let's take Jesus' words about hell seriously. Now, the context of this passage was his teaching about sin and about how we should go to extreme measures to get rid of sin in our lives. Right? If your hand causes you to stumble, that is to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life with one hand than with two hands to be thrown into hell. And with the eye and with the foot. He says it three times. In other words, do whatever it takes to get rid of sin in your lives. Yes, we will always have sin with us. No, we will never be perfect. But do we take Jesus' words seriously? Do we believe that sin can actually lead to hell? Whether it's sexual immorality or pride or addiction or anger or greed or unforgiveness, whatever it is, um, do, you, you know, it's infinitely better to endure the pain of getting rid of that thing, pulling it out of your life, than to endure eternal anguish in hell. And the minute we think, yes, but Jesus died for me, so it doesn't really matter, that should be an alarm bell moment in your, in your life where you are cheapening the grace of God and you think that you deserve salvation and that, that Jesus simply forgives without any repentance, any change of life. No, the two go together. Yes, Jesus saves us completely, and our obedience to him in turning from sin shows that we, that we are believers. So that's the first thing. I'm going to give you some time as we approach the Lord's Supper in a few minutes to reflect and to search your heart and see if there's any sin that should be cut out. Here's the second thing and the last thing I'll share. One way we can love others is to warn them about hell. The message of the gospel is not um, believe in Jesus or go to hell. That's n hell is not the point, but it is part of the message. It's part of the message, and we don't do anyone any favors by trying to soften it or um, promise that there's no such thing as hell or make it easier to, to swallow. Let's simply share with people lovingly and wisely what the Bible says and let them make their choice about Jesus. And the fact is, every person does have to make a choice that will determine their eternal destiny. Maybe that's why hell is inevitable, because God respects people's choice. Everyone has a choice to humble themselves at the cross and receive God's grace or to go their own way. As C.S. Lewis said it, there are only two kinds of people in the world in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All right? If you want to choose to live apart from me, I respect that choice. Thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it, he says. The door to hell is locked from the inside. Well, I hope, friends, that this sermon has been helpful and has been true, but also, you know, has, has helped us understand the, the hard reality of hell, but also framed it in the larger context of the gospel, that hell doesn't have to be our future. Jesus came to save us from hell, from sin and death and hell. He went through hell for us, and we can believe and we can share with others that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to rescue us from sin and death and hell. We have all done things and uh, have things in our lives that that we would uh, that would have the power to throw us into hell. We thank you that you've intervened, you've taken hell for us, and God. <laughs> Help us to respond to Jesus by giving him all of our lives. By um, including ruthlessly eliminating sin with your help in order to be holy like you, to please you. In order to um, not participate in the things that are hellish in our lives. Lord, you want to get the hell out of us. So help us to cooperate with you. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And we pray for friends and family members who it would seem are on the pathway to hell, to destruction. We pray that you would give them pause to turn and reflect Help them to understand the weight of their sin and help them to see what Jesus did for them and use us in their lives however you want. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, here we are, friends, at the table of the Lord. This is God's welcome to sinners. God does not want people to be separated from him. And Jesus came to earth, lived, and died on the cross to welcome us back to God. So let's savor that right now. Let's reflect on just the mind-blowing grace that we've been shown Next week, we'll talk about heaven. I look forward to that. And this is a foretaste of heaven, a foretaste of that final banquet around God's table, which will kick off the beginning of a time that um, gets better and better with every day. Um, So as we come to the table, after I say the words of institution, I would ask you to examine your heart and whether you feel just you know, thankfulness for what God has done, whether your conscience is pricked by the awareness of a sin that you need to repent of, whether you simply, again, want to affirm and receive God's love for you. So I'll give you a moment of reflection that I'll invite you forward. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, after dinner, he took a cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, in my blood, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take a moment of reflection, self-examination.
Jesus welcomes you to this table, friends. So if you are his follower, a believer in him, come, receive the elements, return to your seat, and we will eat and drink them and savor them together. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let's sing the first verse of Amazing Grace together and praise to God. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.